Wheels, and welcome to Faith Flight School. I'm Captain Tyler. Here at Faith Flight School, we learn about the Word of God and how to be doers of it. So you're going to want to make sure that you have your manual, that's the Bible, with you and ready. As we are doers of the Word of God, we receive all that God has planned for us. Are you ready to get this lesson started? Let's start with some praise and worship. Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to worship. Are you guys excited? Yeah, I know I am. Why don't you go ahead and stand up if you're sitting. Let's stretch our legs. Put your right leg out and stretch it left leg and stretch it and reach as high as you can up to the sky and down to your toes and the wiggle loosen up a little bit yeah well i am so excited to sing with you guys can you sing loud for me all right so we're gonna sing and we're gonna praise the lord thank you father with your praise hallelujah hallelujah let my mouth be filled with your praise singing all day let my mouth let my mouth be filled with your praise hallelujah hallelujah let my mouth be filled with your praise singing all You guys know it's really good to read your Bible and pray. It's so good. So we're going to sing about it. And there's a little bit of movement here, so make sure you're ready to move. Bible, pray every day, pray every day, 
Let's take some time to worship the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you.
Kids, it's offering time. Let's start today by grabbing our manuals and turning to the book of Mark. That's in the New Testament, the second book in the New Testament. And we're going to chapter 6. Now let's start in verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Now the day was far spent. His disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out and said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks and in hundreds and fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. Then they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Now, what happened in that story? There are a lot of people who were sitting there listening to Jesus and following Jesus. And they were all hungry, but they didn't have food with them. So then the disciples were like, yeah, let's go have them go to town and get some food. But Jesus said, what do we have? And they found five loaves of bread and two fish. Now I have here is one loaf of bread. Now, if I were to eat this loaf of bread, yeah, I might be, I'd probably be full if I were to eat it, but I'm one person. That verse said there were 5,000 men, and that's just men, not the women and the children. Now, how did all those people eat and were filled with five pieces of, or five loaves of bread and two fish. Well, Jesus first, he saw what they had, and then he sat down, he blessed it, and multiplied it. When we have our seed, we might be thinking, well, I don't have a whole lot to sow in today's offering. It's, it's not even worth that much. I'll just hold on to it. But God didn't say that. He saw that there was a small amount in our eyes, but he still blessed it, multiplied it, he was thankful for it. And because he did, everybody ate. God multiplied the food and everyone ate and they had plenty left over as well. So when we sow, even if our seed seems small, God will multiply it. All we need to do is be thankful and get in faith that God will multiply our seed sown. Boys and girls, it is confession time. Now this is very exciting. Now, let's think about why it's so important that we say our confessions. You know, it's important that we agree 
with what God says about us, right? So repeat after me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, boys and girls, do you know what that means? That means that we are right with God, that we can go right to the throne of the Lord. And we, before, we wouldn't be able to do that. Back, back in the olden times, right? There, they would have to go through a priest, they would have to have a sacrifice, but now, because of Jesus, we can go right to the throne of God. Say this one with me. I'm quick, I'm sharp, I'm bright, I'm good looking, very rich, and a major blessing. Now boys and girls, think about what that means. We said, I'm quick, I'm sharp, I'm bright. Well, boys and girls, that's because we have the mind of Christ. We said, I'm good looking, I'm very rich, and a major blessing. It's because God supplies all of our needs. Our needs are met through him so much so that we have abundance and we can give to other people. So this one, get your doers out. You ready? I'm a doer, I'm a doer, I'm a doer of the word of God. Now, boys and girls, we don't want to just be hearers only but we want to be a doer of the word of God. Now, what do you think that means? That's when we, we hear and we agree with what God has said, we believe it, and then we put it into practice in our lives. Okay, now grab your manuals. Ready for this one, you got it? All right. This is my Bible. It is the word of God. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I can be what God says I can be. Boys and girls, do you know what God says you can do? Do you know what God says you, what, what, who he says you are? Boys and girls, God says that you are righteous that you have been redeemed and that you are chosen, that you are a new creation, you're an overcomer, you have the mind of Christ, you have all of your needs met, you are healed, you are complete in Him. Boys and girls, God has some very nice things to say about you and we should agree with Him. So let's say this again, this is my Bible, it is the word of God. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. And I can be what God says I can be. Hey, Mailman Steve! How Captain are you Tyler, today? How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Praise God. I have a package for you. All right. Wait. That's so exciting. It's a big one. Hot. Oh wow, it really is a big one. All right, boys and girls, now that we got our package, what do you say we open it? Uh-huh. There we go. Whoa, it was a big one. Mind of Christ. I think that goes right there. There we go. Did you know that when you become born again, the Bible says that you have the mind of Christ. Wow. Let's go ahead and jump into today's lesson so we can learn more about what it means to have the mind of Christ. Hey kids, have you heard the story of the woman with the alabaster jar? It's a story that's found in the Bible and we know that if it's in the Bible, then it's something that we can learn from it. Now this story is found in the book of Mark, chapter 14. Now it starts, Jesus is sitting there in the house of Simon the leper, hanging out with his disciples, and a woman walks in, and she has with her this very expensive jar, alabaster jar of perfume. Now this isn't an alabaster jar, but it was probably about this size. But inside of this jar was very expensive perfume. The Bible says it was worth a year's wages. Now, how much is that? Well, let's say that your mom and dad 
went to work every day getting money for clothes, getting money for food, for all kinds of things, bills, everything. They did this for an entire year. All that money is a year's wages. So then in this one jar, this perfume was worth that much money. So she walked over here, over there with this very precious, very expensive jar of perfume, opened it and poured the oil on Jesus' head as an offering. Now there are people there who saw that and said, oh, what is this waste? That jar could have been sold and given to the poor. But Jesus, he didn't think that. Now, before we get into that, let's ask, why did she do that? Why did she take what was probably the most valuable thing she had and offer it to Jesus? Well, it's because she saw Jesus as valuable enough to offer this precious thing. She saw Jesus as worth it. But the other people, they saw that and said, oh, no, Jesus isn't worth enough. They specifically said that it was a waste to give that to Jesus. Now, this wasn't about the money. This wasn't about the money. This was about the heart. She saw Jesus as someone valuable, someone precious to offer towards, so she gave the best she had. And the others, they did not value Jesus enough. That's why they said it was a waste. Let's, let's look at that, at that verse. Chapter 14 in the book of Mark. And let's start in verse six. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them at any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perf perfume on my body before and to prepare for my burial. Therefore, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Jesus said that that this occasion will be recorded for all time. Why? Because she valued Jesus enough to pay this very expensive price. She saw Jesus as valuable enough to pay that price. And God saw us as valuable enough to pay the ultimate price for giving Jesus to buy our salvation. Now, just as she valued Jesus, just as God values us, we need to value each other. And when we value each other, then that is the mind of Christ. You guys have been learning about how precious and valuable you are to God. What makes something valuable? Value is determined by the amount or the price that someone is willing to pay for something. Well, God loved us so much that He made a way for us to be redeemed by the blood of His Son, Jesus. He sent Jesus into the world to die for our sins. When we accept what Jesus did, we become born again and we are made a new creation. Now, as a new creation, we have a very specific identity in Him. We are complete in Him and everything that he has and is, is now ours. Well, do you guys remember Spy Guy? He's looking for his identity now that he's born again. And I asked my friend, Detective Harrison, to help me and share with him who he is in Christ. But Spy Guy, he ran off last time before he got all the facts. So let's check in and see if Detective Harrison has been able to find him. Hey kids, I got a text from Spy Guy I'm trying to find him with this tracking signal, but where is he? There he is! Spy Guy, what are you doing with that box on your yeah. head? Well, I found out who I am! Really? Yes! Well, if you found your identity out, shouldn't you be, like, happier then? One would think, but I've discovered my identity as I'm a failure. Oh, stop. What, did I mess up again? It's what I always do. I'm just a failure. I'm a big lame-o. Uh, That's what I do. 
Spy Guy, you gotta stop No, what? I have to stop again. What, did I mess up again? Uh, well, yes, actually. What did I do? Well, why don't we go over here and we can talk a little bit more about it. Come out of the trash. <sighs> okay. <sighs> Come on, take a seat, take a seat. What's going on, Spy Guy? Well, they sent me out on a mission. Uh-huh. And I failed. I got it all wrong again. And I guess that's just who I am. I'm just a mess up. It's like my only reason to be here is to show not how to be. Don't say that. Why not? Because it's all wrong. Well, when I try not to be wrong, I still end up wrong. Anyway, so why even bother? I should just accept it. I am not Spy Guy. I am a lame who messes up all the time. You need to stop this, seriously. Why? Oh, let me guess. I'm, am I wrong again? Uh, well, yes. Oh, well, big surprise there. Look, lame -o's being lame again. Well, at least I'm dependable. I'm very reliable. And you know what else? All these years, I've been a spy. I was actually pretending to be someone else anyway. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just lame. I'm a lame loser liar. A lamey loser okay, liar. Okay. Spy guy, stop it. Don't say those things about yourself. Don't put your identity in your mistakes or even in being a spy. Why not? I might as well face the facts. I'm a loser. A lame, lying loser. Lame o loser okay, liar. Okay, okay, hush. You're just listening to the devil now. I am? Yes, that's where those kind of thoughts come from. Ooh. But aren't they true? I mean, you just said I was wrong again anyway. But you don't have to be. You can correct it right now. I mean, listen, you asked Jesus into your heart, right? Yes. Okay, then God doesn't see you as a lame liar loser. Maybe you used to be a lame liar loser, but you can repent. Ooh. You can be washed, Ooh. sanctified, justified. Uh, a sanct, a sanct, uh, sancti what? Sanctified. It means you are made holy, just like God. You are made clean. God hasn't just forgiven our sins, he's washed them away. When he looks at us, he doesn't see all the mistakes and the wrong things we've done in the past and our imperfections. When we became born again, he says we became a whole new creation. So old things are passed away, and that's how he sees you now. But I've made so many mistakes since I've been born again. Well, that's all right, that's all right. You see, if you found out that you did something wrong, we all have, then you just repent. And when you repent, God sees you like you never even made that mistake. Like never, ever? How, how is that even possible? Through the blood of Jesus, that's how. When Jesus went to the cross, he paid the price for all of our sins, for all of our mistakes. And so his blood is more powerful than anything we've ever done, more powerful than any mess up. You're not a liar and you're not a sinner. You may make a mistake now and then, but that doesn't change who you are. That doesn't change what you are. So who am I? Well, besides uh, a <laughs> spy guy, you're a new creation. You're a child of God. Child. So, okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means that your identity, who you are, is in what God says about you. God says you are forgiven of all your mistakes, all your sins, all your lying and losing, you're forgiven. Oh, okay. He says you're righteous. That means that you're made right with God. And he says you are valuable. Wow. <laughs> I am? Yeah, that's why he paid the ultimate price for you. God loves you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for you so you could become a part of his family. Why don't you come with me and let's keep listening to the lesson and we'll learn some more. Okay. Come on, let's go. Okay. Mm. Mm. 
Did you hear that? That was really sad. Spy Guy was putting his identity and value in the mistakes that he made. He was thinking that he was a failure. Well, that's not what God says about us. When we become a new creation, we become washed clean. We're not failures. We are who God says that we are. We're overcomers. Let's continue with the lesson today and learn more about who we are in Him. Boys and girls, I am so excited to keep reading this story with you. We've been reading about Sammy the Seahorse and all of his adventures all over the ocean. I wonder what happens this time. Sammy was swimming along the ocean floor when he decided to take a rest near a big rock. He had been swimming for miles, seeing all kinds of colorful plants and fish all over the ocean, but it was time to take a break and rest. Just then, the rock moved. It started to squiggle and wiggle behind him, and he scooted away in shock. And then the rock grew tentacles. Hello? Who is there? Shaken, Sammy answered, It's just me, Sammy the seahorse. Are you, are you a talking rock? The big rock laughed. Ha ha ha, I am not a rock. Then the rock began to change colors. I am an octopus. My name is Oliver. Sammy was in awe. Wow, I have never seen an octopus before. Did you just change colors? I did. I can change colors to blend in with my surroundings. I can turn blue, or green, or purple, or yellow. That is amazing. I can change colors too. But I don't understand how we can change so fast and so perfectly. Well, we were all given the mind of Christ. He made us all quick and sharp and bright. When we see an enemy or we get startled, we are able to quickly change colors in order to protect ourselves. That's true. When I sense danger, I'm quick to know to change colors. He's helping me and I didn't even know it. That's right, Sammy. God has given you great abilities. You are made complete in Him. When you look to Him, you can accomplish all He has for you. Just like we can change colors, you can learn quickly, gain understanding, be strong, and so much more. Sammy was happy to hear this, and he was excited to see what God had in store for him. He said his goodbyes to Oliver and watched him change back into looking like a big rock. Sammy felt refreshed as he realized his abilities come from God, and he is always helping him. He swam along contently, continuing his adventure. Boys and girls, this time Sammy met Oliver the octopus. And you know, I was thinking, he learned so much about how when we're saved, we have the mind of Christ. We become complete in Him. And he was telling Sammy that he can be quick and sharp and bright. And that reminded me of our confessions, right? So when we are saved, all of that, we become complete in Him. Oh, I'm so excited to learn more about this with you all next week. Good idea. My name is Jake Perenna, and I'm an archaeologist. I travel the world in search of ancient artifacts. When I'm not hiking through the jungle or swimming through croc-infested waters, you can find me at the campsite, studying the most important artifact passed down to us. The scripture. Well, good day there, Beth Sprouts. It's been a minute. Oh, you don't remember me? Well, it's your old friend Jake Perona from the land down under. I know it's been a minute, but I have been doing some really interesting things. I've been traveling all over the world. I've been especially doing a little bit here in Africa recently. I've been going over across the Mediterranean sections of Africa, through the Sahara. Most recently, I've been going up Mount Kilimanjaro. Well, check out this picture. Well, while I was getting ready to go up Mount Kilimanjaro, I was in the Valley of Umba. 
and I was talking to some of the locals there trying to resupply, get my granola bars. Well, they got to talking to me about this mineral called tanzanite. It's a really neat purple looking stone. Check this out. Well, this tanzanite stuff they were talking about is really, really rare. They say it can only be found at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro in the Umba Valley. Isn't that amazing? You can't find that stuff anywhere else in the world. You can't find it in the United States, in Australia, in New Zealand or Europe. You can't find it anywhere but this little valley at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro. And that reminded me of a scripture. You know, in John 14, 6, Jesus turned to the disciples and he told them, he said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Well, that's just like the Tanzanite, isn't it? You can only find that stuff in the Umba Valley. And just like that, the only place a child of God can be found is bought and made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only place you can find a true child of God. Well, anyway, I've got more travels to do, but I'll have to catch up with you guys later some more, and I'll have to tell you about some other journeys that I took. Boys and girls, did you know that above all other things, God values people? We are his most precious possession. I want you to get your manuals and open with me, read along to Psalms 49, 6 through 9. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever, that he shall continue to live eternally and not see the pit. I'm also going to read that the last two verses, verses eight through nine from the Living Bible. For a soul is far too precious to be ransomed by mere earthly wealth. There is not enough of it in all the earth to buy eternal life for just one soul to keep it out of hell. God says here that there's not enough wealth in all of the world to buy one soul or to redeem one soul. That means you are more valuable than anything else in this world. I want you to also open your Bibles to, or your manuals to Isaiah 43, 4. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. I'm also going to read you that in the CEV, which is another translation. To me, you are very dear and I love you. That's why I gave up nations and people to rescue you. The God that created the universe values you. He loves you. And the enemy would try to tell you that you're not valuable or that you're not important. And that is not true. You should never listen to that because God values you. You, he, you are important to him. I want you to open your manuals to John 3.16. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten Son, so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish but have eternal life. God gave his one and only Son because he greatly loves us. He greatly loves you. How do you determine the value or the worth of something? By what you would pay for it. God paid the ultimate price for you and for me and he loves each one of us. Okay guys, so we have been talking about how the Lord has told us that we're supposed to love God and love people and not stuff, right? And so in 1 John 2.14, it talks about how you're not supposed to love the world and the things of the world, but we love God and his people. And we all know John 3.16, right? It said God so greatly loved the world that he gave his son. And that's how he showed that he loved us. He gave us a gift. And then there are other verses in the Bible. It talks about, especially in the New Testament, how we're supposed to walk in love with our friends and our brothers and sisters. That can be hard sometimes, can it? Sometimes they aren't being very loving. But you know what? The Bible says that when we have Jesus on the inside, that love of God is on the inside. 
then we can love, choose to love our brothers and sisters. So it's very important to God. He talks about it a lot, that people are more important than stuff. So we have an example today in the Bible, we back with a guy named Abraham. Now, this is before his name got changed to Abraham. His name was Abram at this part of the story. This story is found in Genesis chapter 13. And you can read it along there, or I'm, I'm, you can listen to me tell it and look at it later. So, we have Abram, and Abram had a nephew named Lot. Now, Lot um, had gone to live with Abram, and they, when the Lord sent Abram out to another land, he said, go and follow me into this land. Lot went with him. Now, if you remember, Abram had a lot of wealth. The Bible says he was very rich in herds and flocks and servants and silver and gold. If you go and look in Genesis chapter 13, you will see all those words. So God had blessed Abram and Lot because he was hanging out with Abram. God was able to bless him too. And so God blessed Lot. And so their herds and their flocks kept growing and growing and growing. And you know what happened? The land wasn't enough grass. There wasn't enough gra grass and water and everything to feed all of those flocks. And you know what that, then what happened then? Uh-oh. The herdsmen, those are the people that feed and take care of the animals, they started fighting with each other. And Abram was like, oh no, that's not good. Now, have you ever had an opportunity like that? where maybe your brother or your sister is used, playing with the toy you want to play with and it's not your turn yet and you want to get into strife? Yeah, it's, it's tricky sometimes. The devil likes to use strife to get us to separate from our friends and our, and our family, especially brothers and sisters. But Abraham was like, no way, Jose, buddy, we're not doing that. So he took Lot up there, up on the hill, and he said, okay, I want you to look over the land. Now on this side, there was rich land with lots of water and it was green and there was room for all of the flocks and it was beautiful and on this side the land wasn't so nice it had some water it had some grass but it it wasn't very nice this one was closer to town this one was way out in the middle of nowhere and lot looked at him and he goes hmm they looked out over and he goes i think i like this side i want to go where it's nice and rich and there's water and there's town and yeah let's i'll take this side and you know what abram was like great now, have you ever offered somebody like that just to be nice and then they take the bigger cookie and you go, huh, well, a Abram didn't do that. And you know what? There were two reasons. There were two reasons that Abram was not upset. He said, great, you go ahead and do that. You go ahead and be happy in that land. Take your flocks and go and live in that land. Two reasons Abram wasn't upset. Number one, he was putting lot and people over stuff. So, I mean, they were great. They had lots of herds and flocks, but they were just stuff. That was like money back then. He goes, he's more important than that. And the also, he was trusting God. That God would take care of him no matter where he needed to live because the Lord had sent him into this land. So, I want to read to you what God said after Abram and Lot separated. So, Lot took his flocks and his family and they moved to this side. And Abram and his family went to this side. This is what God said in verse 14 of, of Genesis 13. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And he goes on to say he'll make his descendants as... as um, Many as their uh, you know, descendants on the earth, and he goes, you know, you're going to be taken care of with all these things. Isn't that an amazing promise? Now, he didn't wait till he had that, that promise before he gave Lot the better land. He just trusted that God was going to take care of him because he put people over stuff. And that's what we're going to do. Right, boys and girls? The next time you have an opportunity to get upset, you can go, no, nope, I love people more than stuff. In fact, I want you to say this after me. I value and treasure what God values and treasures. Other people are more precious and valuable to me than things or possessions. I love God and I love people. Kids, everything that the Bible says you are, you are because of the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me too. <laughs> Fact, anchoring ourselves in the Word of God gives us a solid foundation. Yeah, it does. Hey, so what are you doing with this anchor here? Oh, well, I just carry it around with me to remind me of that fact. Oh, that's really smart. <gasps> I got an idea. You want to play pretend? Sure. Okay, can I see your anchor? Sure. 
All right, okay, so this anchor reminds you of your solid foundation in the Word of God. Right. So since I took away your solid foundation in the Word of God, what if a problem comes and the problem is that someone is making fun of you? Whoa! Whoa! Fact. Without my anchor, I would surely topple over. Yeah, you would. So I think you need this back. Thanks. Now that you have the word of God, you have your solid foundation, you are anchored in that for sure. That's right. <laughs> what if that problem comes again and someone else is making fun of you? Well, you sure aren't moving much. <laughs> yeah, that's right, because I'm anchored. Fact, the Bible says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And it says that I have the mind of Christ. It also says, if he is for me, who can be against me? That's one of my favorites. <laughs> that's a really good one too. And that's gonna be our anchor. That's gonna be our solid foundation when we stand on the word of God when those problems come. Oh, hi. Right. Back again. Let me tell you about another one of my adventures. Right, so I was up in the savannah and I stumbled across a herd of elephants. Check out this footage I took. See that there? That's a baby elephant with its mother. It's probably only a couple of months old at that point. Well, that's pretty neat, isn't it? Well, let me tell you something really neat about baby elephants. See, elephants, they have the longest gestation period of any animal on Earth. Isn't that amazing? They are pregnant for 22 months with those baby elephants and then when they finally come out the babies are nearly blind so they've got to take extra good care of them. Well after they get over the blindness then they are nursed for six years. Can you imagine eating nothing but baby food for six years? Munchy peas and carrots and peaches blah blah. Anyway these baby elephants are not only taken care of by their mother, they're taken care of by all the females in the whole herd at the same time. It's a really neat phenomenon called allomothering. Well, this breeds a really strong herd culture. And this herd culture protects the elephants because when they act as a herd, they can all act as one. They have wisdom in the herd. They can protect each other from predators and they also remember and they travel around to the exact same spots year after year. Whenever the seasons get dry, they go to the same wet holes and they can get water even in the driest of droughts. Well, that reminds me of something else. You see, we as believers, we have access to wisdom as soon as we're born again, just like those baby elephants do. You know, we have access to the mind of Christ. You know, Jesus was the wisest man that ever lived. He was wiser than even Solomon was, and he was a pretty smart guy. Well, we have access to Jesus' mind whenever we're born again. We can ask him for wisdom, and he'll give it right to us. Isn't that amazing, boys and girls? Well, come back next time, I'll tell you about another story. All right, boys and girls, it's time for our In Him Confessions. We have been doing this over the last several weeks, and so let's do first off a quick review of some of the things that we have learned during this time. We've been looking at our puzzle pieces, and we have um, the ones we've done so far are redeemed, righteous, new creation, and chosen. Now, all of these things are, do you guys remember? That's right, they are the benefits or promises once we become complete in Him. And remember, we become complete in Him and we become born again. When we become a child of God and we accept what Christ did, then we become complete in Him. And there are certain things that we have and are as a child of God. We have and are everything that Jesus did 
we have and everything that he is, we are. And so that's what we've been doing over this series. We've been learning how to build our solid foundation on who we are in Christ. So we let that define us and that tell us that we're valuable and precious, not anything in the world. So we have another new puzzle piece that we've been going over this time. It is the mind of Christ. Now, just a reminder that this means that we, as a child of God, now that we are complete in Him, we have the mind of Christ. That means that when Christ comes and lives on the inside of us, we have all of His wisdom and His strengthening and ability in us and in our minds. But it's our responsibility to call on that wisdom. It doesn't just appear. We have to ask Him and use our faith and believe God to give it to us when we need it. So no matter what we're faced with, if you're at a, your desk and you have a test, you can say, you know what? Pray before you start or while you're in the middle of it and you need help with a problem. You can uh, ask the Lord and speak out and say, you know what? I have the mind of Christ. He brings all things to my remembrance. And you can ask him to help you. And that wisdom will be there. The Holy Spirit will rise up in you. And you'll know on the inside what to do and how to do it. And that's part of having the mind of Christ. That we have the wisdom and ability on the inside to do what he's called us to do. But not only to do it, but to know what his plan is. You know, we need wisdom to live in this earth, and we need wisdom to know what he's called us to do. Every one of us has a plan and a purpose, and that's why having the mind of Christ is it's one of my favorite benefits. And so um, we're going to get our confession poster out. I hope you guys have been reading yours every day and confessing it. Let me get mine down. I'm gonna remind you what we've been doing with this. So with this, we are writing it out, right? All of our confessions, we're hanging it somewhere where we'll see it every every day. Um, I put mine in the bathroom. You could have yours in the bathroom or in your closet or in your room, on your mirror. And as you're getting ready or just starting preparing your day, you speak these things over yourself, right? As a child of God, it's our job to speak out what God's word says. We do not allow the enemy a place in our lives. When something's going on, like, like if we have confusion in our mind or let's see, what are the other ones? Um, if we don't feel like, you know, righteous, if we don't feel like we're right or we're just, you know, down on ourselves and feeling like we're no good or not good enough, we don't, we do not allow those thoughts in. We speak out what God's word says. No, he says we're righteous. And you tell the enemy to leave your thoughts and to get out because he has no right to be in the child of God's life. But we have to stand up and speak it. That's why these are so important. We speak them out in the morning so it reminds us all day long of those benefits. You know, I have, some of you might have phones or no, even a notebook that you have at school. I like to have mine on my phone. And so if something's going on during the day, I can pull that out and I can speak it. If I, you know, especially at the beginning while you're learning these and you don't maybe necessarily have them memorized, but as you do, you'll get them deep, deep down in your heart and it'll just start popping up out of you when something's going on. And that's a really good thing. Whenever anything happens, immediately the first thing you should do is speak out the word of God and you say what he says when anything is contrary to it. All right, so I like to match my colors. So I'm gonna grab orange and we're gonna write our confession on this. Now I want you to repeat after me first, so what our confession is this time. It's about the mind of Christ, so I want you to repeat this after me. I have the mind of Christ, and I can do all things through Him. That's right. So I'm going to write it down. You get yours out, and you write it down as well. All right, do you have yours written? If you don't have it with you right this minute, that's okay. You know, you can keep watching it or you can pause and put it back up. I'm gonna hang mine up. Oh, and these magnets are slippery. All right, well, thanks for joining me and join me next time when we come up with a new puzzle piece. <laughs> Hannah the human. Dewey the dog. What's going on? Uh, 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 hold still for a second. Mostly the same, really. Just, just kind of reddish. Hmm. Uh, what? <gasps> they look red too. <laughs> Dewar, what are you doing? Is this what they meant? Is, is what what who meant? Well, you know how you know how we've been talking about about um 
about being precious in his sight? Well, yes. Well, when, when they were talking about precious in his sight, they talked about the way that God sees us. Mm-hmm. And I heard somebody say that God sees us with the eyes of love. That's right. So. So, 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 okay. So, um, so is that why you, there? the glasses? Yes. Oh, the okay. Glasses. Okay, so how are you seeing people through the eyes of love with the glasses? Oh, well, uh, Tom Teller, uh, he saw that I was looking at these glasses. And he uh -huh. was very kind, and he gave them to me. Very wow, nice. that was very nice. And uh, I saw these glasses, and I said, oh, that's got to be it. The eyes of love. Get it? Oh, well, Dewar, that's not exactly what that means. It's, it's, it's not? Mm -mm, not really. But, but I can understand. <laughs> I have the mind of Christ. Yes, you do. And I can help I understand you. Understand any? But please tell me. <laughs> I will. Okay. So when you have those glasses on, what exactly does it do? What is it? What does everything look like? It makes everything slightly redder. Right. It filters everything to look red. Yes. When we see people through the eyes of love, the way they that they look red. <laughs> No, no, they don't look red. Is that what you look lovely means? No, not quite. But here, are you ready? Okay, because I'm gonna, I gotta tell you. Oh, okay. Okay, so when, when we put on the eyes of love, when we see people the way God sees them, it filters out anything that they've ever done wrong. It, we see them the way that God sees them and he sees them as valuable and he sees them as righteous, and he sees them as they have the mind of Christ, they are so smart, he sees them as precious. What? How does he only see that? Like, I mean, God has to see the bad things we do, right? Like, he, he, Jesus is watching, you know? It's, it's... <laughs> well, <laughs> God has to use faith to see us that way, just like we have to use faith to see people that way as well. So, seeing with the eyes of love is making a decision by faith yes. to see people the way God sees them. Exactly. We have to choose and use our faith to see them the way that God sees them. Oh, and so when they were talking about judging others, that's, that's not seeing them with the eyes of love. Right. That's seeing them with the eyes of judgment. Right, we don't want to do that. I don't even so, know what shape those glasses would be. <laughs> well, we don't even have to think about it. <laughs> so let's use our faith and choose to see people in love and choose to see them as valuable and precious and all the good things that God made them. And not just redder. <laughs> That's right, not just redder. <laughs> Kids, God loves you. He values you. You are his precious treasure. If you have not asked Jesus into your heart, let's take time to do that now. Repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for choosing me. I believe in you. I believe you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again and he's alive right now. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. All right, that's so exciting. You receive Jesus in your heart. It's the best thing you'll ever do. We love you guys, and the Lord loves you and values you. Wow, we have been learning so much about the benefits that we have as children of God. Today we talked about how we have the mind of Christ, that we don't have to be confused in any situation, and we can have the wisdom of God on what to do in every scenario. Well, that's all the time that we have for today, but I want to encourage you, make sure that you're saying out loud the confessions that you've been writing down with Miss Kelsey. That'll help get them rooted and deep in your heart, and you'll be confident when you speak them out. Until next time, I'm Captain Tyler. We'll see you soon.